Good morning, First Church. How are you? Well, just like last week, there's even more items on the loop this week. So you really need to get on there to check things out. There's just so much happening um, with the holidays coming up. But we're glad you could be here to worship with us. We've got the Wilkerson's here this morning. So excited um, to worship together. So coming up, next week is the first Sunday in November, and there is a youth fundraiser happening right after church. It's a Mastacholi dinner. Um, you'll get your meal, your bread, and your drinks, and please come out and support the youth right after church next Sunday. Um, there is a collection for non-perishable food items for the Thanksgiving baskets this year. We're hoping to collect enough for 20 to 25 baskets. We're um, also going to be making one of those dinners and um, distributing the meals to individuals that are by themselves and may not be making their own Thanksgiving dinner. So if you want to participate in that, there's a list on the loop, but any non-perishable items that you can think of that you would use for your own Thanksgiving dinner, um, canned goods, canned green beans, gravy, cranberry sauce, um, also some of the items like macaroni and cheese, instant mashed potatoes, those kinds of things. If you could collect those and bring those to the church by November 13th, um, Val Gregory is heading up that drive for Thanksgiving, so please, if you'd like to help, please let her know. Also, you can contribute money if you do not want to do the shopping yourself. We'll take that as well, and we'll go out and get those items. Um, we've also got the craft fair coming up on November 19th. That's a Saturday, so um, if you know anybody that's a crafter, they can pay, I think it's $25 for a table, and they can come and sell their wares, and the um, proceeds of that event are also going to go to the um, youth conference that's coming up. On November 20th, ladies, um, I believe that's that Sunday, immediately following the church service, we're going to kick off our ladies' holiday Bible study. So please let the church office know if you're interested in um, doing that Bible study with us. It's going to happen throughout the year, approximately monthly, um, and it'll coincide with all of the holidays. So we want to make sure that we get you your books. Um, I will be serving lunch for that, and we're just going to have a great time of fellowship. So please plan on attending, ladies. Um, Senior Saints is coming up on November 3rd. It's at 2 p.m. They're going to have soup and crackers, and you can bring your favorite sandwich to share. So again, don't forget about that, seniors, uh, November 3rd. The second Sunday of every month, um, Gary Horsley leads the church service at Spring Hill Village. If you are interested in helping with that ministry, please talk to Gary. I'm sure he could use some help. Um, that service starts at 2 p.m. on the second Sunday of the month. I'm trying to think. It's the very last Sunday in October. So again, if you have not loved on and appreciated the pastors, I'm sure they'll take that anytime in that prayer. But particularly in October, we want to make sure that we um, love on them, pray for them, their wives, their families, and just um, do something special if you can. All right, I'll talk to you soon, First Church. Thank you. All right, we're getting ready to go into our next part of the worship today. And if before I start, if you're wondering about the getup of me and some of the kids, it's because we did the Essential 100 series during kids' church and Sunday school as well, and they worked really hard, and they were working for a pajama Sunday, and it just so happened to be on the day when nobody else is here to take the offering. So <laughs> here we are. But thankfully, it doesn't matter what we look like, right? We can worship and honor God no matter what we're wearing, and um, today is just one of those days. So it is our honor to get to worship and celebrate the Lord this morning, and this is his day, and we're in his house, and it's just so exciting to be here. Anybody else excited to be here today? Yes. And it's always a great pleasure to have the Wilkerson's with us to worship with us, and I'm so excited about that as well. Um, so this is really a great part of the worship service and a great part of honoring God with what we have is to be able to recognize what it is that he's given us and give back a portion of that piece. You can't look at what you have or what you have to give and not recognize the fact that you have it only because God gave it to you in the first place. Um, so anything that we do give is a testimony of God's goodness um, and how he provides for us. Second um, Corinthians 9, 7 says, we must decide in our hearts how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pr um, pressure for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So just like when we worship and we praise and we get excited to honor God with our vocal worship, we can get excited and praise and give honor to God and celebrate when we give our financial offering to him as well. So Lord, use this offering to benefit your kingdom, God, to expand your kingdom, um, 
We just know that you have great plans for us, and you provide for us in so many ways. We just thank you for all the ways that you've blessed us, and we just have great expectations of your presence here among us today. And Lord, we just ask that you bless the gift and bless the giver. Amen. You can come forward with your offerings. new creation i've been forever changed by grace i know i've passed from death to life well it's plain to see i'm different my whole life is rearranged what he's done for me this world cannot deny i am evidence i am living proof i'm a walking testimony to what faith in god well, I'm a witness to the wonder that forgiveness, mercy gave. And I give evidence that Jesus saved. Just a cup of cool water I'll give in Jesus' name. It'd be a spring of life to one in need. And if I'll walk beside the weary, gladly go the extra mile, it would draw them to the Christ they see in me. Oh, I am evidence, I am living proof, I'm a walking testimony to what faith in God can do. Oh, I'm a witness to the wonder that forgiveness, mercy came. I am evidence that Jesus saved. Oh, I am evidence. I am living proof. I'm a walking testimony to what faith in God can do. Oh, I'm a witness to the wonder that forgiveness, mercy gave. And I am evidence that Jesus That was wonderful. And if we can take just a few minutes to greet one, each, one another this morning, we'll just do that right now, too.
you, as you make your way back, I wanted to start off this morning by sharing a word of thanks with you all. I wanted to say thank you. I know that it has been Pastor Appreciation Month, and as always, you all have been so loving and so generous, and so I, I just wanted to at least give you a word of thanks. You are very much um, appreciated. I've always before loved Pastor Appreciation Month, right? Because I think each of us can say we've been in a place where we've had really great pastors in our lives that have changed and shaped us and helped us to become who God has called us to be. And I've always loved honoring them. But then when you go into ministry, it becomes a weird thing, right? Like it feels weird to be the a, a recipient of that love and generosity because you know that you're just a person, a, a person who, yes, has been called and loves people and wants to do that, but you don't feel like you deserve that kind of love from other people. You know what I mean? So it's always been awkward. But I, I did want to say on behalf of, of the pastors, thank you very much. Your kindness is very much appreciated. As we go into our time of prayer, I wanted to share with you all something that I came across this week in just my own time, um, some studying and some devotional time. I came across an article, and as I was reading it, I believe the article was from uh, John Piper. And as I was reading through it, I came across um, this section on prayer. My, my question for you all was, why do we do this? Why do we observe this time of prayer? We, we do it every week, um, but we do so for, for many, many reasons. And, and I'm not going to go through all those reasons, but this one this week struck me a little bit differently. Because sometimes we forget that we are at war. That behind the scenes, and what we don't always see or what we don't always recognize is that there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place for our souls. And so often I think that we forget that that is going on. And as I was reading this article, this is one of the things that was said in here. It says that corporate prayer intensifies camaraderie in spiritual warfare. All praying, in my mind, is spiritual warfare. Even just simple domestic family things or other insignificant issues. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the fa of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The logic of this is very striking. I have appointed you to bear fruit so that whatever you ask, you'll get. It means prayer is designed for fruit bearing. Prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie, not a domestic intercom. I have given you a strategy in my warfare so that your walkie-talkie will work because it doesn't work when you're AWOL. It doesn't work when you're out of commission. One of the reasons prayer aborts in its significance for people's lives is that they try to turn a wartime walkie-talkie into a domestic intercom. They want to ring up the butler to bring another cushion to the den when it's designed for war. Prayer is designed for ministry, calling in firepower and air cover. It's not designed to make my boat start this afternoon. That's, that's deep and that's, that's challenging for so many reasons. I've told you before 
not that long ago that one of the things that I love most about our pastor is that prayer is at the very top of his priority list. And he really tries to convey to us the significance of prayer for our lives. And this is one of the many reasons. He knows very well that there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place. And as the pastor, he cares for our souls. And he wants to see us succeed. And so this morning, as we go into our time of prayer, I would love it if we could come together and pray as a team, right? Because Satan knows and understands that when he can get us by ourselves, we are more easily defeated. But see, you and I, we're on a team, right? We're a family. And so let's come together before the Lord on one accord and pray that he'll be with us as we face what we're facing in our lives, as we go through what we're going through. So if you would like to, these altars are open. If you want to come with your families and with your kids um, before that they end up heading out that way to Children's Church, um, please do so. These are open. But if not, um, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning. Lord, first and foremost, with thankful hearts. You know, as Pastor Bree alluded to just a little bit ago, Lord, we recognize that what we have isn't just by chance or by coincidence, but rather because of a, a loving and a merciful God. And so, Lord, we, we worship you this morning. We exalt you this morning. And Lord, as we come together in prayer, Lord, we thank you this morning for the reminder that there is a spiritual battle that takes place that oftentimes we can't see. Lord, we recognize that there is an enemy that is out to kill and to destroy. And so often we, we lose sight of that and we lose focus. And in our moments of weakness, he wins, maybe just a battle at a time. And so, Lord, any of us that are here this morning who are struggling with, with sins uh, in their lives, Lord, we bring those before you this morning because we want to have right relationship with you. Lord, we want to be the kind of people that bear fruit like you've talked to us about in your word. And so, Lord, we come before you this morning and we offer those up to you. Lord, conviction is not always fun, but it is necessary. And so we're thankful for the Holy Spirit and what he brings to our lives. But Lord, as we come, there are some people in this room this morning. We're all on different paths this morning and we recognize that. But Lord, there are some people in the midst of battle really struggling with some things, really going through some things. Lord, there are some of us here this morning that have a wayward child who has lost connection with you. Lord, we bring those prayers before you this morning. We bring before you our struggles and our battles. Not not just because we're looking for an easy way out this morning, Lord, but we understand that it is through you that we will find victory. And so, Lord, we bring those things before you this morning. Lord, there are some of us that are on the opposite this morning. Instead of being in the valley, we're on top of the mountain. And Lord, we, we thank you for that this morning. Lord, I pray that you will help us to continue to be more and more like Jesus. I pray that you will help us to grow deeper in our prayer lives. Like that reading said this morning, Lord, it isn't just a place where we go to ask for things, but rather where we confront our spiritual battles head on. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that 
that you will touch those that are sick, heal folks this morning, and that, Lord, you will be with us as we journey through this life. It's not always easy, and you never promised us that it would be. But what you did promise us, Lord, is that you would never leave us or forsake us. And we are trusting in you for that this morning. And so, Lord, as we come, Lord, we pray that you will be worshipped this morning, that your name will be glorified this morning, because, Lord, you are worthy of our praise. And so, Lord, come. Be honored this morning. Be lifted high this morning. And we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. 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 Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Let's worship together. He is Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and he carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing I'll sing it out this morning Jesus Messiah, name of the morning, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. broken and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and that veil was torn and it's love so amazing yes love so amazing yeah jesus messiah You are Lord of all. 
Amen. Yes, he is. That's right. Hallelujah. Let's all stand in the presence of the Lord today. Why have you come to the house of the Lord to worship him? Amen. Lord, we lift your name on high today. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. Whatever lies before 
sons and as your daughters with hearts full of thanksgiving. And we say thank you for the cross. We say thank you for sending Jesus. We say thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our comforter. We come into this house, a house set aside, sacred, set aside to worship you. And we ask you so humbly to meet with us today. Meet with us as a people, as a group. And Lord, meet with us individually. Speak to our hearts and change our lives. For it's in your precious, holy name we pray. And the saints of God said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence today. If you're part of First Nas Kids, you may go at this time. I was told if you're 4 to 94. I don't think I was told that. Amen. Can I say what we say in Tennessee? Ain't God good? I'm so glad that one day Jesus was willing to come and drink the bitter cup for you and me. And he walked those streets of Jerusalem. And he came with a name that was given to him that was high. And the Bible says he was highly exalted. He was given a name above every name. And I'm so glad that he was willing to lay aside the glory. Fully God. Fully man. And give his life a ransom for you and me. Praise the Lord.
on the name of Jesus. It's a wonderful name. I don't understand why people don't get more emotional. <clears throat> he is the one who saved you, not just to go to heaven, but to have victory right here and right now. I could say Salah and think on that. Some of us are just wanting to go to heaven. I mean, no, you can have a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in. Come on now. I want to start off by asking you a question. It is so good to be with you again <clears throat> this morning. My wife and I love your pastor and, and uh, your pastor's wife. We know you love her better than you love him. That's always the way it is. But we've known them since college days. And, and he was a good fellow back then. I, I knew him back then uh, a little bit more. I'm, I'm uh, younger than he is. Maybe by 12 months. I don't know. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> he's got more hair than I do, so I guess he's got me on that right, that right, that way. But I want to ask you a question as we start this morning. It's a simple question. <clears throat> what is in a name? What is in a name? Why should you and I be so happy when we hear the name Jesus? What is in a name? A name really says a lot about a city. Now, you're looking at a, a fellow. I have preached in a lot of different places. And uh, <clears throat> I, I've preached in a place called Crowville. Anybody ever been to Crowville? If somebody raises their hand, I'm going to fall over right now. <laughs> Crowville, Louisiana. Now, you can imagine with a name like Crowville what they must have a lot of. How would you like to go out today in the parking lot and see about a thousand crows? There would be a ministry, a skeet ministry in the church, wouldn't there, fellas? I mean, that really would be an appreciated ministry. I don't think by the government, by the, but by the people trying to get into the house of the Lord, that would be, be wonderful. But it says, a name says a lot. We, we, we uh, have preached a lot in southern Illinois, and uh, there's a place in southern Illinois, believe it or not, that's called Sunnyville. Now, that's a nice name, don't you think? We've, preached, uh, we've uh, gone by a place called Industry, and I think that's a great name for a town, Industry. Uh, if you go to my home state, now I was born in Indiana, praise the Lord. That's why you think there's a little good in me. <clears throat> now, it was Evansville, so it's about as southern as you can get. But there's a place in Tennessee called Friendship. Now, wouldn't you, I mean, that just screams welcome mat, doesn't it? Friendship, Tennessee, come. Our, our church can be your home. That was a good thing in the church. There, there's a place in Tennessee called Sunshine. Sunshine. Wouldn't you like to live in Sunshine? I know my dad, uh, he, he pastored in uh, southern Florida for 27 years. He loved the sunshine down in the Sunshine State. There, there's, other, there's other places there, uh, and, and I know a lot of people like sermons like this, short and sweet. 
there's a town in Tennessee called Short and Sweet. Uh, <clears throat> let me think of the thing with other. Oh, yeah, then you've got the other kind of towns in Tennessee. Here's one called, there's one called Bug Scuffle. I mean, that sounds like it's a Friday night fight thing going on, Bug, uh, the Bug Scuffle. There's, there's one uh, called uh, Lick Skillet. Anybody been to the great metropolis of Lick the Skillet? You know, there had, only had to be two in that meeting to decide that name. Uh, sweet Lips. I, I picture kissing booths as you enter the town. It's sweet Lips. Here's one that some of you might have gone by on I-40, Bucksnort. Anybody been, been by Bucksnort? You'll see it. If you're not watching the road, you'll see it in about 10 seconds, and that's it. But there is a town called Bucksnort. Uh, and then there is a town, we've been to this town, <coughs> Moodyville. And now if, if Pastor Denny was here, I'd say, how would you like to pastor the Moodyville? Church of the Nazarene. I, I just don't know if I would, if I got a call from a DS, you know, they always say, I've got an opportunity in Moodyville. I don't know if I'd take that. Uh, now, here's one Bitter End. Who names their town Bitter End? But there is a town uh, just north of where I live. Uh, if you come out of the Ashland City Church of the Nazarene there, there's a, a green sign. And you got uh, you can go to uh, difficult Tennessee if you take the left, or you can go to defeated Tennessee. How would you like to pastor the defeated Church of the Nazarene? I'd have to I'd have to come up with a board meeting and <clears throat> and say we need to change this. I had a pastor's name one time, and I said, I said his name was first name was Derek. I said Derek, you got to change your name, and he said why? I said your name is Derek Boring. And I don't know about you, but if I was a pastor, I would not want people to walk around town saying that was another boring sermon. It's kind of like a doctor when you go and it's, you know, Dr. Butcher. I can take you to one right by my dad's dentist office, Dr. Butcher. But I think my favorite name in Tennessee, as far as the town goes, is this, Nameless. Now, you know that had to be a bunch of guys who could not make up their mind, and they decided they wanted to go eat some fried chicken, and they adjourned the meeting. And then the town just became known as Nameless. Names are important. Uh, by the time that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he had already been given three different titles or three different names. In Isaiah chapter 7, uh, he had been given the name of God, Emmanuel. That's her daddy's church name, Emmanuel. Isn't that a good name for a church, Emmanuel? God is with us. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and, and uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel. And, and then in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he's given the name of a king. For unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And then in our text today, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel of the Lord comes to Mary and gives him the name Savior. I like that. She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. I don't know about you, but I like that name. He shall save his people from their... Oh, don't miss that. Not just from hell, but from their, but from their sins. I want to make it clear at the beginning of this message, I'm not just talking about... <clears throat> Uh, using the name of Jesus in a superstitious way this morning, but rather those of us who have been saved and born again, we have the right to use that name. Two people. I said we have the right, we have the right as sons and daughters to use that name. 
But just saying in Jesus' name at the end of a, at the end of a prayer does not mean that that it is the will of God. Come on now. I've heard a lot of people use his name in a vain way, in a wrong way. But I'm not talking about that. But, you know, I have two little baby girls. I keep calling them baby. They're seven, and they keep, one wants to be seven, and one wants to be 20 already. And I'm like, baby, just be seven. But I gave Chloe and Hannah my name. I thought long and hard about what to name them. Their names mean something. One means a tender plant. The other one means double favored of the Lord. Chloe, Elizabeth, and Hannah Grace. And you know what? They carry the name Wilkerson wherever they go. And they have all the rights and the privileges of bearing my name. They can say daddy and it means something. Because they have my name. They bear my name. They carry my name. People have told me before, you're so patient with them. I said, it's because they're my kids. I probably wouldn't be as patient with your kids at 2 o'clock in the morning. But with those who bear my name, oh, it means so much to me that they bear my name. It me I love that they bear my name. I love that they have my name. They can use my name. They have all the rights and privileges thereof. You and I are sons and daughters of King Jesus. This morning, I want us to consider four things about the name of Jesus. First of all, his name identifies him with his person. When you read your Bible, you'll see a capital J and a capital E many times. It's the abbreviation form for Jehovah. Everybody say Jehovah. Oh, when's the last time you called out on Jehovah? The first syllable of Jesus' name identifies him with the manifestation of Jehovah God. The word of God clearly indicates that there's one and only Savior, there's only one and only one Savior, Jehovah. Isaiah 43, 11, I, even I am the Lord, all capitals, and beside me there is no Savior. The word Lord in all capitals, when you see that in your Bible, is always a translation of the Hebrew word Jehovah. And since Jehovah is the only Savior, then it's appropriate that Jesus' name as Savior is Jehovah. This is who, have you ever thought about this? Who did the old, how did the Old Testament saints get saved? How were they redeemed? They, they were saved the same way that you and I are, by faith. By faith in Jehovah God. This is who he was and who he is. He is Jehovah God in flesh. He is Lord and he is Savior. The second part of Jesus' name, the S-U-S part, is the abbreviation for that, for Savior. The second syllable of his name, of Jesus' name, speaks of his mission and the manner uh, of which he would go about and the method of the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks of his love. It speaks of his compassion, his unselfishness. Did you know how unselfish it was for King Jesus to leave his throne and come as a man? It speaks of that. Jesus as Savior, get this, came to earth and lived to save sinners. He died to save sinners. He rose from the dead to save sinners. He is even now, the Bible teaches, even interceding in heaven to save sinners. And one day soon, he is coming again to save sinners. His name, listen, beloved, his name identifies his person. He is Jesus and he is Savior of the world. He is the one and the only Savior that this world has because no other could fit the bill. Number two, his name identifies him with his purpose. What was Jesus' mission? What was his purpose? 
Everybody say this with me. Say this with me. The redemption of man. The redemption of man. Uh, Jesus, what, what did the angel say to Mary when the angel came? You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. He shall what? Save his people. Deliver his people. Anybody need deliverance this morning? Anybody know anybody in your family? Or your friend, circle of friends that needs deliverance? Introduce him to Jesus. Because he's the deliverer. And he, he shall save his people from their sins. Friend, his name literally means, when you and I say the name Jesus, Yahshua, or when you read the Old Testament book, Hosea, do you know that, that word, Yahshua, that, or, or, or excuse me, Hosea is literally the Hebrew word for what? For who? Jesus. And so when you read the book of Hosea, his name literally, if you break down the name Hosea or Yeshua or Jesus, is what? Salvation and deliverance. That's what Jesus' name literally means. That's why we are, it's one of the main reasons why we're commanded to pray in the name of Jesus. In our society, it's become very um, okay for Christian ministers to stand in an open room where there are not Christians and to pray to a generic God. But I'm one of those, if they ever asked me to go, and I've had friends that have been asked to go speak before legislatures, and they do not back down about being a son of Jesus. There is, listen, there is a difference. Can I, can I just be honest with you? There is, we, we must use his name, we must, because we bear his name. We, another way to say that is we carry his name. The Ten Commandments tell us not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It's really not saying there, don't cuss. Now don't go cuss. There's a lot of other scripture for that. But do you understand that that Ten Commandments, that one of the Ten Commandments is talking about that we must carry his name properly. If you say that you're a child of God, then act like a child of God. Don't make people go, what in the world is that? They were there at church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, screaming and hollering and hooping and hollering and praising the Lord, and then they cussed me black and blue. You know what that is? That's carrying the name of the Lord in vain. They, people should have no doubt about whose you are and who you belong to. Amen? Jesus came to deal with man's number one problem. You know what that is? Sin. We have a problem. We call it a sin problem. And I don't care what generation you belong to or, or uh, whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, everybody, it's called a human problem. The human condition has a problem. It's called sin. You go all the way back to Adam and Eve disobedience but aren't you glad that we have a merciful heavenly father amen aren't you glad we don't have a heavenly father that doesn't treat us like little bunny foo-foos some of you know who they little bunny foo-foo hopping through the forest picking up a field and bopping them on aren't you glad that we don't serve a god like that? all of you'd be bald like me flat-headed if we got what we deserved, come on now. But his, his, his purpose was to redeem us. Uh, that was man's number one problem back then, and it still is today. Sin will take you further. Listen to somebody needs to hear it. Sin will take you further than you want to go. You say, well, I'll just, I'll dabble it. No, 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 it don't work that way. It'll take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will always cost you a whole lot more than you want to pay. And I, as a pastor, have dealt with generational type sins. We're in a family. Somebody said, well, that's just on me. You ever heard that, Pastor? Well, I'm only, my sin only affects me. My sin, no, 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 it affect, not only affects you, it affects your wife, it affects your husband, it affects your children, and your children's children. Because how many of you know, 
those kind of sinful habits are hard to break. And you know why they're hard to break? Because most people try to deal with it in the natural. They try to deal with it. How many of you know God will do for you in your salvation and in your sanctification what you cannot do for yourself? Now that was deep right there. And I know some people have been trying for years to get set free by their own willpower. It don't work that way. You are set free by having faith in the one who not only will save you, but he will keep you and he will deliver you. He'll deliver you from all kinds. The Bible says that we're delivered uh, from oppression, oppression of the mind. Did, did you know a Christian can be oppressed? Did you know that a Christian who loves God with all their heart, soul, and mind, they can watch the wrong things and become oppressed, and they try to get away from it, and they try to get away from it, and they try to get away from it, and they say, what can I do? You need to call on Jesus. You need to ask him to come down and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He'll set you free from the oppression of the mind. He'll set you free from obsession of your flesh. Come on now. There, there are men, I, I, my, I love to go home to Nashville and, and Wednesday nights we go and, and there's a Bible study and there's all these men from about 15 different houses that come in and, and, and they've come in from every kind of addiction that you can think of. And one of the things I love about getting around these fellas is many of them have got it. They've understood that they can't do it. That it has to be God that does for them. What they've tried to, they, they, listen, somebody like me, I, I asked them, why did you get involved? I don't know. Why are you still, I don't know. And people like you, you know, me who've never done certain things, I, I don't understand that. But they understand that. And I'm so glad that I hear the reports of how they say, I don't know how I got in it, but I know how I got out of it. And it's when I called on Jesus and I trusted him fully. Jesus came to set the captives free. Amen. That is a good place for a, a shout. Do you understand that he's not waiting for you and I to get to heaven? He wants us to have victory right here and right now. And on the cross of Christ, praise the Lord, I'm looking on the cross of Christ, not only was your salvation purchased, not only was it purchased, but your sanctification was purchased. Do a little study on that sometime. And what did, you, what did Jesus say on the cross? It is The work is, wait a minute, you mean I don't have to add to that? No, you better not try. And if, you, if we ever understand, if we will come to that, that realization that it's not anything that I can do or not do, it's already been accomplished on the cross. My faith has to ever be in his cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came to set the captives free. This Jesus did in his death and his life. He purchased us. He redeemed us out of the hand of the enemy and he broke the power of sin for all who will trust in his work. He dealt with. He paid for. Mm. He paid the debt that we could never hope to repay. And we all must come to the realization whether we've been saved for five minutes or 50 years, that he alone can save. I can't save myself by what I say or don't say or what I do or don't do. I tell you what, that's a harder thing for people who've hung around the cross a long time to really receive. Not by works. Pick your feet up if you get offended easily. Not by works, lest any man should boast it is the freely given gift of God what is the meaning of this word savior savior means one who delivers one who preserves one who keeps one who secures I love that that I, I serve a risen savior 
and his salvation secures me. As long as I'm in Christ, say amen. As long as I, as long as I stay in the house, I am secure. I am glad that he preserves me. He keeps me. He, he, he keeps me from being taken captive again. I don't have to sin in word, thought, and deed every day. There better be 500 amens in this church today. I don't have to fall to sin and, it's, and Satan's schemes every day. He whom the Son has set free is free. He's free indeed. Hallelujah. Well, why, why did, you see, this is, this is how I, my mentor used to say it. Jesus fought the fight and we get all the benefits. Aren't you glad of that today? Some of us are trying to fight this fight in the natural and you lose every time. Quit trying to fight this fight in the natural. Your pastor has it right. Prayer is a weapon in the hands of a believer. Say amen right there. Oh, and all, I've got a message. I, I, I about came out of my seat. All prayer is warfare. My little girls at seven and they'll pray sometimes, God is great, God is good. And then sometimes they'll pray, dear Jesus. And they'll pray from their heart. That's how I say, pray from your heart. And they'll pray. You know what they're doing? They're doing warfare. Amen. They're doing warfare in the home. When you thank God, when you just praise God, go read the story of Jehoshaphat in the Bible. And when you praise God, when temptation comes, you know what happens? That sends confusion to the enemy's camp. And if you read that story, you'll see where an, the angel of the Lord came into the enemy's camp and 184,000 of the enemy were smoked. Because they, Jehoshaphat decided not to, to come against all those other armies in the natural, but he sent out the choir. He sent out the praise team. And they began to praise the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And if we would respond that way, instead of trying to fight in the natural, we would see victory. Oh, why did Jesus do this? Not because we deserve it. We didn't deserve this deliverance. Romans 5, verse, verses 8 through 10. Most of us know part of this, but we never read, read down through verse 10. But God demonstrated his own, or showed his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, let that sink in. Some of you think you've got to get cleaned up to take a bath. Some of you think you've got to get cleaned up to come to Jesus. You don't get cleaned up. I, I, that's an odd person if you get cleaned up to take a bath. No, you take a bath. You come to Jesus, and he does the cleaning. Come on. From the inside out. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than. Now get this. Much more than, if you're born again, listen to what I'm about to say, having now been what? Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now receive the reconciliation. Now, when did we receive reconciliation? Everybody say now. That's important for a little bit further in the message. We already have it. Some of us are trying, you know, we, I love the old hymns that we do. We, we sing a lot, but some, you know, in the sweet by and by. And sometimes we get into the mentality that we're just waiting to get to heaven. And that's a wrong mentality. You need to have joy and peace and love and, and all that he has for you right here, right now. Why? Because he's paid the price. His name identifies him with his purpose. His purpose is to totally and completely be the savior of the world. And then number three, his name identifies him with his people. Now let me get through this. is just a little snippet. But I feel like I need to address reformation, uh, uh, reform theology that's sweeping our churches. The Jewish people are considered to be his people. The church has not replaced Israel. Two amens. 
The Lord Jesus belongs to the Jewish people, and the Jewish people belong to him. Jesus, few facts, Jesus was born a, he was born a Jew. His name is a Jewish name, and this identifies him with them. When the gospel was first preached, it was first preached to the, to the Jews. His first disciples were Jewish. John chapter 1, we, we misquote this all the time, or we don't understand the context of it. He came to his own. Who were his, the Jewish people? He came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become be called the sons of God. Even to them that what? Believe on his name. How are you saved? You have to believe. In spite of Christ's national rejection by Israel, God still loves the Jewish people and he desires for them to be saved. I have a lot of people, many times I'm asked, well, you know, because I've done some Bible studies on the book of Revelation. They say, why, why about, why would we, uh, why will the world go through the great tribulation at the end of days? Well, one of the main reasons, I believe, is to redeem the house of Israel. To bring them to repentance and faith in the one who they rejected. The one who is the Bible, as the Bible says, is the cornerstone. Jesus. It's even called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a pretty Jewish title if you, if you do a little Bible study. That's why. Because he, has mercy, because he is merciful, not wishing that any should perish. But all should come to repentance. But listen to this. All who call on his name, all who believe in him for salvation are considered to be his people. If you have called out on his name and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, believed in your heart, confessed with your mouth, guess what? You're one of his. You are his people. John chapter 6 says it this way. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Friend, he will save all who come to him for salvation. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Hallelujah. And then his name, number four, identifies him with his praise. We, we came into his house today with thanksgiving, hopefully, in our hearts. Jesus is his glorified and exalted name. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 says it this way, Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is to be worshipped as creator of all, redeemer and savior to all that will, and Lord of all. You shall call his name Jesus. I want to close this morning by asking you two questions. What's in a name? Well, in Jesus' name, there's salvation, there's healing, and deliverance. The Bible says it this way and teaches this, that every good thing can be found in him. If you want good things in your life, look to him. I want to illustrate what I'm trying to get across this morning through a, through a, sto uh, uh, through a story that I heard many years ago. It was about a maid. Um, who worked very hard. She worked, uh, she lived in a little shanty. Anybody know what a shanty is? Anybody old enough to know? My dad was born in a shanty. A little, a shanty for the younger ones here today. Picture a, a, a couple of wall, four walls and a little roof barely put together. And if a 40 mile an hour wind comes, it's probably going to blow down. It is not a house like you know it today. It, it can blow over real easy. It's where all the poor people would leave and uh, she lived in one of those and she worked six days uh, morning noon and night uh, she got off on Wednesday she had a good uh, 
uh, employer that would let her off for Wednesday night. Remember when we had Wednesday night service? And, and uh, so she, this is set back in the, uh, I want to say the 40s. Uh, and so, <clears throat> and then Sunday she would go to church. And then she'd come home. Her employer, uh, who became her friend, had lots of artwork in her house. She finally died, and after the reading of the, the will, a picture that the maid had always stopped by and, and just really looked at, and, and, and it was her employer's favorite picture, and they would talk about it. She died and had a, the reading of the will. Uh, the employer was so moved by this employee's love for this picture that she gave it to her. Now this, uh, this lady took it and put it up in her little shanty. Can you imagine this fancy oil painting up in, up in a shanty? It was out of place. Ten years go by in the story, and, and she, was, she had to get another job, and, she was just, and it, the other employers weren't as nice and cleaning houses morning, noon, and night, and she was barely getting by living uh, just a meager existence as a maid cooking, and cleaning. One day, her church got a new pastor. And after uh, she got a knock on the door, and, and he introduced himself, and, and uh, he invited, she invited him in, and she was kind of embarrassed. You know, there's didn't even have but one chair in the whole place. You know what you did in a shanty? Young people, if you didn't have a, a lot of furniture, you had five-gallon buckets. And that was where somebody else would sit. And so the pastor sat on the little five-gallon bucket. And he finally, the elephant in the room <clears throat> was this picture. And he, and he was an art lover. And he said, I, I have to ask you about this beautiful oil painting. It's probably worth some money. And she really didn't care about it. She just brought her, her pleasure, you know, just looking at it. And she said, yes, the lawyer came. And after they read the will, evidently, and... And we were friends with the, my employer, and he shoved it in the door, and he really didn't like to be on this side of town. He was in a three-piece suit, and uh, he wanted to get back to his fancy car and get in it and get out of town <laughs> as quick as he could. She said, he, he gave me this, and, and uh, he said, well, would you mind if I took it down and looked at it? And she agreed, and when he took it off the wall, a couple of envelopes fell out the back. And the, he noticed, and he just thought, being an art lover, he said, well, this is the provenance for the painting. This is a nice enough painting. It's, this is the provenance. And he said, is this, is this the provenance? And she said, the prova what? He had no clue what he was talking about. She said, I, this lawyer just shoved this in and said, read it for yourself. And she said, I can't read that well. And uh, I just put it back there and forgot all about it. He said, would you want me to read it for you? And I've done this as a pastor many times. I've read legal documents. And she said, would you do that for me, pastor? And he took it. And he said, sure. And he took out the first envelope, began to read it. And his eyes began to light up like big saucers. And, uh, you know, I was, if I'm reading something somebody else wrote, I don't like to read it out loud. I read it silently. Because you might run across a few words that you shouldn't say as a pastor or a Christian. I've had that happen to me. And uh, she said, Pastor, why are you so excited? You're, you're getting excited. And I'm excited. I've waited 10 years. Tell me what this paper says. Is, you know, is this a famous painting? And he said, no. He said, your, your employer really did like you. She not only left you this painting, but this is a title deed. To some property across town. It's not over in this side of town. In fact it's over on the other side of town. Where she lived. And he said. I know I'm new in town. But I've, I went all over. And he said. This is a really nice piece of property. And so they began to praise the Lord. And she said. Read the other one. She got excited. So that pastor took out the envelope. Began to read it. And his eyes got big again. And. Uh, she said, what is it, Pastor? What is it? He said, this is some numbers to a bank account. Now think back. I think it was in the 30s is when this was said. And, uh, 
and he said, she said, what, 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 what is it? What does it say? And he said, this has $642,000. Now, you do the math, some of you who are old enough, what $642,000 was back in the 30s and 40s. That's a lot of money. And you know what that pastor did? Excuse me just for a minute. He went, Woo! Glory! Some of you don't know why that pastor shouted. Man, he was like, he was thinking the time. I'm going to go back to that church board and talk to them again. I would too if I was the pastor. If I found what would be over a million dollars. Just been sitting there. And they began, I could just imagine if they were Nazarenes, they would have danced anyway, whether you liked it or not, or I liked it. You know, they, woo they'd, have kept one, my, they'd have kept one foot on the ground. They would have been praising the Lord. Think about this, though. Think about this story. I, just told, I told you that story for a reason. This woman, who was a good woman, who loved Jesus, nothing about her not loving Jesus. But she had barely been getting by for 10 years. All because she could not read what she already possessed. She already had it. It was sitting in a bank account. It had her name on it. And yet, she was not walking in the fullness of what was there for her. I want us to look at Ephesians as we close today. And it says this in Ephesians. Remember, I asked you, what's in the name? Are you born again? Do you bear his name? Do you understand what is yours as a child of, of God? Here it is. This is what you possess. In him. Everybody say Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. Now that's a whoop glory right there. The forgiveness of sins. Now back in my daddy's church, they literally would get up and walk up and down the aisles and wave hankies. I'm talking about the young and the old alike. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he has made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. You say, how can I know the will of God? Read your Bible. Come on now. If I say, Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit and you'll know the, the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He has purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Here it is again. In Him. Verse 11. In Him. Him. Do you notice a little thing going on here? In Him. Also, we have obtained an inheritance. Ooh, glory. Some of you didn't even know you had one. You just thought it was about going to heaven. We have an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory in him. You also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss this. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee. Oh my. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Anybody filled with the Holy Spirit in this place? Oh, you should know this. Beloved, what do we possess because we bear his name? Just like this maid, we have an inheritance. Church of the living God, he has purchased us with his own blood. He has redeemed us. We belong to him. The Holy Spirit, get this, this is what this just said. The Holy Spirit is the first deposit. Mm, is the first deposit of our inheritance. You know what we have as an inheritance right 
now. You already have it. You don't have to wait to get to heaven. Have it. We have eternal life now. Now, some of you ought to get a little more excited about that. Some of you are kind of, oh, wait a minute. Some of, you, some of us are living like we're going to have to die to have eternal life. Mm. <laughs> Do you know, some people, you know, they have what, I, what we call in Tennessee hee-haw theology. You know what that is? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Big, dark, depression. This misery. If it were for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. I go to churches and people look like they've been dropped in a persimmon bucket or something. If you have the Holy Spirit, if you've been born again, we should have joy unspeakable and full of glory right here, right now, because we have eternal life now. But how many, hmm, Brother Mike, how many live their Christian lives like this, this woman, good woman, hard worker, but they live in a broken down shanty house of faithlessness, never having answered prayer, never having joy, never having victory in the fullness of abundant life right here and right now. All because they do not know whose they are and the power of having his message. You and I are the sons and daughters of God and we have his last name and all that he possesses is available to us. He has given us, beloved, the title deed. He has given us the Holy Spirit as the guarantee. That word literally means first deposit. When you go and buy a house, most of the time, what do you got to put down? Some of you to look my age, you know, earnest. My, earn, think about that word, earnest. That means if I'm willing to plop down a couple thousand bucks or five thousand or ten, whatever it is, that means I'm serious about this. And the Lord has told us, he said, I've given you the Holy Spirit to show you how serious I am about you having not only life, but life more abundant right here and right now. And by the way, Jesus is the guarantor. How many of you know that your guarantee is only worth what the guarantor is worth? If they have a bad name and if they won't keep their word, then it don't matter if you have a guarantee. But how many of you trust Jesus? And I'm so glad. See, the Bible says he's what? He's the alpha and he's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. The Bible says he's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He's the door of salvation. He's the sheep gate. He's our way maker. He is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He's Jehovah Nisi God. Jehovah Sitkanu, our righteousness. Elohim, he is Adonai. He is El El Yon, the most high one. He is the great shepherd. He is our high priest. He is the head of the church, the eternal one. He is the great I am. He is the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. He is wonderful. He is counselor. He is mighty God. He's everlasting father, the prince of peace. Oh, he's the final judge, the final amen. He is my everything. He is my all. He is Jesus and he is savior of this world. That's who the guarantee or is. Now see, some of us, if you've not been born again today, I want you to come over to this altar when I give an altar call and get saved. And you'll, exp you'll experience not only life eternal, but life more abundant there. Oh, who is this, this Savior I've been preaching about? His name is Jesus. And then the last question I want to ask you, do you bear his name? That's really who mainly I've been preaching to as Christians today. And if you bear his name, listen, can you honestly say you have possessed all there is to possess as a daughter of the king? As a son of the king? 
Are you walking with power and victory and love and anointing and joy? Some of us are walking around. Yes, you're saved. Yes, if you died, you go to heaven. But you're, you're about a, as miserable as a Christian can be. And I'm telling you today, it don't have to be that way. You can have joy right here and right now. I don't care who wins the election. You can have joy. Now, I do care who wins, but I'm, I'm telling you, you can have joy. Listen, that's a, if we would be the people of God that we've been called to be, the world would look at us and say, oh, my. I have to be one. I, I have to know who they know. I want us to stand in this moment. And I want to share one scripture with you. Do you possess all that there is to possess? This is decision time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm just going to read this mainly. Verses 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house, that's your body here, this, this tent. How many of you know you are a spirit? You live in a tent. Come on. Come on now. And you have a mind. You have a soul. Soul, spirit, and your tent, your body. But if this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. Woo! Now, if you'll just sit... This afternoon, think about it. Some of us are so concerned about this tent, and take care of your tent. But understand, when you leave this tent, you're going to get a house. You're going to get a house. From God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly. Desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Do you understand? You're going to get a new building. I know some of you like your building down here, but people <laughs> like me, yes! If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent... We groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up with life. Oh, I like that. Do you understand? This old tent's going to be swallowed up with life. Now he that has prepared for us this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. There it is again. He's given us the Spirit as the first deposit. So we are always confident, knowing this, that while we are at home in this old tent, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well, pleased, rather to be absent from the body than to be present from the Lord. Friend, do you know Jesus? If you don't, come to this altar and be saved this morning. Pastor Mike and I will pray with you, and you can pass from death to life. But listen to me, saying, I've been talking to you all morning. Are you possessing all that there is to possess in Christ as a child of the King? Or as, I, as I've been preaching, have you said, you, you've identified a little bit with that woman who loved God, but she wasn't possessing all, it was there. She had a heavenly, she, she had, I mean, just, just like that woman loved her, we have a heavenly father who loves us. He's given us every good thing. If not, I want you to come this morning as Jennifer sings this song, The Goodness of God. And I want you to believe that the God who saved you is the God who, who will not only give you life, but give it to you more abundantly. Possess all that he has for you to have this morning. As Jennifer begins to sing, will the people of God, if God's been speaking to you,
Holy Spirit's been speaking to you. I want you to come today and say, I want all of it. I want to be all that I'm supposed to be. Come on, Jennifer. I want God to have all of me, and I want to belong all totally to Him. He is a good God, and if you will ask, He will give it to you. You have not because you ask not. Come on now. Come on, saints. Let's have a time of prayer. Grab the altar right now. Let's pray. Oh, your mercy never fails yes, Lord. me all my days. Come I've on. been held Anybody? in your hands. Anybody possessing everything you need? From the moment that I wake Woo. up Thank until you, I, I lay sing. my I head, I oh, sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful, yes. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. And I love your voice You have led me through the fire Any darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Oh, I have lived in the goodness of God, yeah. Come on, what's the thing that you need this morning? Because all my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness. God, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, oh yes it is, your goodness is running after, it's running after me, with my life laid down, I've surrendered now, I give you
Surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, I'm telling you, listen, saint, this message was for you today. Don't accept mediocrity anymore. Don't, don't accept for just getting by to get by anymore. There ought to be some people on fire for Jesus so hot in this church that if somebody comes and sits by them on Sunday morning, they catch on fire themselves. Yes. Hallelujah. There, people ought to see you in the church and out of the church with some joy, Amen. with abundant life. Oh, hallelujah. Brother, come down and you just pray a blessing over this man. I'll tell you what, God did something today. Amen. He did something today in his people. And we ought to give him praise for that. Amen. Honey, go pray over here. Go over and pray over here. Listen, I'm telling you, God loves you. He loves you. You say, well, I've just been getting by. You don't know me, Brother Bob. I've had a bad attitude for a long time. How many of you know God can come down in an instant? If you will just say yes. Listen, I said something a while back. Just a few moments ago. You have not because you asked not. You say, well, Brother Bob, I asked 20 years ago. I asked a year ago. The Bible says, and it's there in Matthew 7. And I haven't read that in a long time. But it, it says, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. You know what that really is saying in the original language? Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. And the Bible says, blessed are those who seek the kingdom of God first, for they will find it. And some of us, we think, we, we look at prayer. I know you've got a pastor who prays. But some of us look at prayer like going through the line like I did this morning at McDonald's. And we say, Lord, if it don't get done by the time I get up here and get my ham sandwich, then I'm just going to forget about it. Keep on seeking and keep on knocking. Because I'm going to tell you one thing. God keeps his word. No better guarantee or than Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And listen, get happy about going to heaven. Get happy about that. Get happy, but get happy about living for Jesus now. Amen. I got an 82-year-old father. Every once in a while, it just it, it gets out there. It gets out there where he has a little a moment of joy. It ought to just be out there all the time. Amen. And listen, I'm not talking about some judgmental thing here, no legalistic thing. When one is down, you pick the other one up. Right? Bear one another's burdens. Amen. But there ought to be somebody who's walking on the mountaintop. Amen. And if they get around somebody who's going through a valley, and everybody does, everybody does. What's the Bible say? Mourn with those who mourn, grieve with those, right? But then go read all the rest of that. And it keeps talking about joy and happiness. That means be with people. We live in a world where sorrow comes to everybody. But how many know you can have sorrow come to your life and still be blessed? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Is he good? Oh, I wanted to sing that song today. Turn to your neighbor right now and just say, God is so good. Speak it into their life. Now shake their hands and say, let's go serve our king. God bless you. Take this. Is brother? Yes, one more thing. Well, before we go this morning, can we, can we give these folks a hand and thank them for coming and being with us this morning? Absolutely. It was a good word. It was a good, good word. I tell you what, if you weren't blessed by that or if God didn't touch something in you and cause you to think about things a little different, you must not have been listening because that was, that, was, that was so very good. I tell you what, this morning, 
you know, guys, this is, this is who these folks are. And this is what their ministry is and what it is that they've been called to do. And they travel around and they bless folks like this all the time. It's, it's, it's how they serve the Lord. And so this morning, uh, as before we head out, uh, we do want to take an opportunity to bless these folks and to love on them a little bit and to say, hey, you know, God really spoke to me through you and through your work. So if you would, before you head out, there's one, this, these plates right down here, could we come alongside them in their ministry? Could we partner with them in their ministry and love on them and tell them that we support them as they preach this good news to others. After that, um, let's take this good news, let's store this up in our heart, and let's be who God has called us to be as we head out there to the world. Because that same Jesus that we know and love, a lot of folks out there that don't. So let's carry this on. God bless you. Have a great and wonderful week. We'll see you all back next Sunday. <laughs>